Christ is coming back in 1988. Now that book didn't sell so many copies in 1989. I can assure you that, Robert. <laughs> but what we, it, it hits a little bit about what we talked about last week, where false prophets, right, and false Christ will come back. And they'll say, I am He. And one way you know someone's not Jesus is they come back and say, I am Jesus. Okay, that's how you know they're not. And if they also claim 88 reasons why you come back in 88 and you, put, you know, predict the things. The easiest way to witness to and to disrupt the whole view, the false view of, of your Jehovah's Witness neighbors is to say, hey, let's play the dating game. Because they said it was 1929. Didn't happen. Then they moved it to 33. Just grab all these dates they predicted and prophesied under the authority of the Watchtower, their authority. Deuteronomy 30 says, if any prophet makes a prophecy and it doesn't happen, they're a false prophet. And they are to be rocked to sleep. The nice way of saying that is stoned to death. Okay? And so just the dating game. And so they made all these prophecies and it didn't happen. Where did he come back? When did he establish his kingdom? And they said it happened in, in San Diego. And it would be a great disruptive fire in Brimstone and all that. It never happened. Then later they said, well, it's going to be a quiet more of a peaceful, tranquil, silent prophet. But the fact is, it never happened. So Jesus himself said all of this would happen, right? He said all of these false prophets would rise up. And this is where they get it wrong. On the person of who Jesus Christ is, he's both God and man. On the time when he'll come back, picking these dates, playing the dating games, these obsessions with predictions. And so we're going to get into that more today as we talk about being ready. Everyone say, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. The king is coming back. The next great event in history is the great return of the king. And there's a lot of views, by the way. There's your pre-millennial view, which is what most of evangelicalism is. But then there's also your post-millennial view. A lot of those folks believe a lot of this stuff has already happened. And that we're just kind of seeing the aftermath of it. And then within the premillennial view, there's your pre-tribulational rapture view. Which is fundamentally believes the rapture is going to happen, right? He's going to take the church out, and then there's going to be this awful seven years of tribulation. But then there's the mid-trib view, also called the pre-wrath view. That believes the rapture will happen in the middle of the tribulation, when things kind of like the man of peace shows up, and he's not really a man of peace, right? He's a man of sin. Before it gets, the heat gets too bad, midway through, church is taken out. Then there's the post-tribulational view, which is the church goes through the tribulation. And that and it has the rapture and the second coming kind of is the same event. Now the good thing about those views, we can sit here for days and argue and debate and discuss. We should do it graciously, but your salvation isn't dependent on what you believe about those views. It's not what we call an essential view of Scripture, but it's good to rigorously debate and discuss those things. Of course, what... Um, Brother Rohr pulled me aside earlier and said, my favorite view is the pan-tribulational view. He says, Brother Stu, he says, it'll all pan out at the end. <laughs> so, I appreciate that, Jim. And I'm going to use that this morning. 
Actually, I just did. That happened real quick. So, but we know the king is coming. Everyone say, the king is coming. The king, the king is coming. Is coming. And we want to lift his name on high, and we want to be ready. And Jesus is going to exhort us here in the latter half of the all of that discourse. Arguably, the most difficult passage in all of the gospel parts. So we're going to jump in both feet here, guys. And we're going to do what we always do, we're going to read the scriptures aloud together. Starting in verse 24, right here on your sheet. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be dark, and the moon will not, not give its light. Stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of God coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. Now learn this is powerful from the fig tree, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And the earth will pass away, but my words by no means pass away. But at that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only, only the Father, take heed, heed watch, watch and pray, for we do not know when the time is. is. It is like a man going from far country, who left his house and gave authority to the servants, and to his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in, in the evening, at midnight, at the throwing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And for what I say to all, watch. This is God's word. May it be a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. Amen. So, context, for those of you who just joined us today, maybe you weren't here last, last time, how does Jesus answer his disciples' two questions? Who remembers those two questions right at the beginning of chapter 23? What were they? When shall these things be, the destruction of the temple, and what shall be the sign of the temple? Yeah. And these are two pretty sharp questions. This shows they were, you know, they were aware and they really wanted to know. When will these things be? And what will be the signs? Because Jesus just talked about the devastation of the greatest monument, the greatest building in Israel's history. The great temple, originally built by Solomon, and some of the foundations were st still there from Solomon's construction, which you read about in the Old Testament. Then later restored by Ezra and others, and now after 80 years of construction, Herod the Great built this absolutely palatial, beautiful temple, enshrining all kinds of gold. And Jesus says, not one of those stones will be, be unturned. And he talks about the devastation of this temple, which really hits it right at the heart of everything they are. This is their national identity. And this is the center of all worship. But sadly, as you know, from chapter 11, when Jesus cleaned house, that they had turned his father's house, a house of prayer, into what? Den of thieves. Den of thieves. It was a big trading place. They were selling on religion. They were making big money, making big coin on all these proselytes coming, worshipers from all over the world to celebrate Passover. And they, you know, the exchange rates were terrible. They were they were hitting them back and forth, man, making big, big money, selling these animals, you know, racking up the price on these animals. And, and so Jesus turned the tables over, and now he talks about how these stones are going to be turned over, and we know. As a prophecy, there's always an immediate event that happened, and then there's a future event that happened. The immediate was what happened in AD 70. We talked about that some last week. Sadly, Titus would come in, and he would absolutely wipe out the whole the whole city, burn it. They, they crucified so many Jews in AD 70 that they ran out of wood for the crosses, the build crosses. It was horrible. It was bloody. 
And they, they raised the temple. They burned it to the ground. And they burned everything. And what happens when you when you burn? What happens to what melts when you burn it? What is a fine metal that was decorating that temple? Oh, yeah. And so, and where does the where does the gold go when it melts? Yeah. And when you have this massive fighting army with you, and you need to reward your soldiers with plunder. And what a soldier's like more than anything? What bounty is the most valuable? Gold. Gold. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the only way they could get to the gold was to do what? Dig in the stones and turn over every stone. Get to the gold that it melted, that it went between. It is fascinating. So you have you have the word of Christ coming true right there in the prophecy. But then there's an apocalyptic future devastation and destruction that he talks about. Where brother will betray brother. And family member will put family member to turn over to be put to death. And he gets into that. We talked about that last week. And the persecution that would even get more intense. And nation will rise against nation. There'll be wars. There'll be rumors of war. There'll be great earthquake and all these things. So, <clears throat> so those that's kind of what's set up getting into here. And so Jesus, verse 24, <clears throat> picks up with saying, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be dark, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. So there will be catastrophic natural events like we've never seen that involve the stars and the moon and the sun and all these things around. And so one question I thought <clears throat> that I've always enjoyed discussing and that is, will things get better or will things get worse? Now, on the better side, is there anyone here that doesn't want to see revival? Right? We want to see people come to Christ. I mean, a, a few major heads of state in our world come to know Jesus. You know, you you know, there have been nations that have you know that have, you know completely turned around because of that. Even in modernity. And so, you know, we, we, we're praying for that, but also you see these prophecies, and you see things getting worse, and you see, you see things you've never thought. Just could be, you know, uh, you know the, the reporting of the, just how awful it gets with the human trafficking, and, and there's more slavery, by the way, today than there ever was. Oh, right, right, right. You know, right. even the centuries right. ago. So, are things getting better, or are things going to get worse? I'm going to sit down and let you guys talk about that. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Anybody, everybody? It's not a good time to become an insurance salesman. Okay. Caleb's invite people to get an insurance salesman. Both will happen. Okay. At the, pretty much at the same time. Okay. Interesting. Both will happen. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right here on, on the other side, too, right here. Yeah, Jesus, particularly in Matthew 25, it would be an awakening of the sleeping church just prior to the sun. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, God knew. There is an equal response to the yep. kingdom of darkness. Just like the book of Acts, you see on two rivers flow, one of revival, another persecution. Yeah. That's going to happen before he comes. And he'll use that uh, affliction, that testing, just like Dr. Gall said last week, to form Christ's character in us, to mature us, yeah. to get us to know him more intimately. Yeah. And also we'll finish our work, our commissions, wow. to take the gospel and also to make disciples. Prior to this period, he will take a mature church. Okay. Wow. Amen. All right. Very good. good word. Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody testify of how the fires of trials getting worse in your life actually intensify revival in your faith in your own life? Anybody yeah. testify about that? Any yeah. testimony? Look at Western North Carolina where you see down the station. But you see people coming together, churches. Yeah. Yeah, great word. Yeah, you see it in the Western North Carolina area. A lot of folks are, uh, and a lot of people are waiting. Has anyone ever been around? I mean, this, would, this would be a good day, by the way, to, for Brother Colleen to be here because I know he testified. Or well, you have, maybe you could testify, Jeff Wood. Has anyone ever been around a believer who's been persecuted? 
suffered much for Christ. And can you tell me why are why would they be so on fire? Anybody want to testify about that? Twice a week we are online with those in Lebanon and those in Israel. Uh, and uh, Sam and Elia, when they get on and pray, it's another level, people. Yeah. It's yeah. another level. Yeah. level. And it, they talk about the grace of God and their, 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 their peace that they have in Jesus in the midst of the fear of everybody around them. They don't know if the missiles are coming in. This is their last day. And yet it is incredible. Uh, persecution. We got people uh, being persecuted all over Asia. Uh, where, I, where I work is in the 1040 window. 19 countries. Uh, there, there's a reason there aren't any Christians there. They get killed. That's <coughs> what. Uh, and they, when they say they are believers, they're believers. Uh, they're, they're going out knowing that today may be their last day every day. We don't do that here. I give you example after example. How many of you follow Christ as though your life depended on it? How many of you have seen? Your eternity uh, yeah. depends on it. Yeah. Anybody else real quick? Uh, I hear her. Yeah. Yeah. We interviewed not too long ago an Iranian woman. Her name is Mizera. Mizera was saved by Christ in a dream. Christ came to her in a dream in Iran. She became a Christian. She started teaching Bible classes underground. The Iranians found out about her. They arrested her. They threw her in a dungeon. No toilets. They threw food down to her. Prisoners next to her were being executed. They asked Marisa, this Iranian woman, all you have to do is sign a statement saying that you denounce Christ and we'll let you go. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. You can hang me if you want to. Word got out. And when the Iranians found out the pressure was being put on them for what they had done to her, they released her. And she came to America. She wrote a book called Captive in Iran. So she would surrender her life Christ did not surrender her faith. Wow. So awesome. now, those are the those are the people we need to hang around a little bit more. Let them rub off on us, right? And so there's an urgency. Yeah, Pete, right here. Pastor Brunson's a good example. Pastor Brunson, yeah, in prison. Yes, yes, sir. So, um, verse 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now ver read that verse with me, guys, out loud. Verse 26. Then they will see some man come in the clouds with great power and glory. So, Jesus is talking about himself and his great return to king. And notice how he comes back. First he comes in the clouds. There's a glorious nature to that. He comes with great power and great glory. How is this a little bit different than his first coming? <laughs> Which we're celebrating, by the way, here at Christmas time, right? Amen. Amen. If you don't understand his first coming, you won't quite get his second coming. It's real important. Text block. Yeah, well, uh, Stu, I mean, I, I will say that you're correct. It's going to be much different, but at the first coming, <coughs> You have the heavenly host. The angels show up, and as it says, the shepherds were sore afraid. So they, they got a little shock. They got a wake-up call, and then they went in. They said, come, let us go and see this great thing that's happened. And they go in, they see uh, Mary, they see Joseph, but they're looking for the baby. And then they rejoice, and they go out and tell people in, that, in Bethlehem what, what has happened. Yep. So that happened, and that's, that happened in space, it happened in time, it happened in history. Jesus is born, and you know other things are going to happen. Uh, Herod's going to kill the, the children, so they flee to Egypt, and the, the story moves forward. But um, Jesus ascends into heaven after he's resurrected from the dead. He, he ascends to heaven, and he goes up into the clouds. It says the in the first chapter of Acts, he goes up, and the disciples are looking up, and two angels appear, and they say, Men of Galilee, why are you standing uh, looking up into heaven? This same Jesus will come back in like manner. So 
He went up into the clouds, and he's going to come back in the clouds. That's, that's one. And the second thing I would just say is the first time the Lord destroyed all, all life, all flesh off of the earth, he said to Noah, I'm putting my rainbow in the sky so that I will see it and remember what it is. I'll never again destroy the world by flood. He's going to destroy the world the second time by fire. Peter talks about that in his epistles. But the rainbow is where? It's in the clouds. So the second time, the rainbow maker is coming back in the clouds. Oh, and every eye yeah. shall see him. Yeah. Even they that pierced him, yeah. and they're, they're going to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those who are looking for him, which are the Jews, who are looking for their Messiah to come back and save them. Amen. Tony got something too. I just want to say that I'm no Bible scholar as I should be. I'm, I'm learning as we go. But the first time when Jesus came, like you said, he was in the stable. And things were fairly calm. It was quiet. The second time, uh, he ain't going to be that way. Let me tell you what, brother. I thought this was going to be sounding. And the lids on the grave are going to be popping. And these people all over the earth are going to be rising. Wow. And praise God, if you're right, we're going to, we're going to just go right on up there with you. Yeah, that's very so good. it's not yeah. going to be a quiet time. Yeah. It's going to be a very noisy time. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. And, and, and it'll be different from his triumphal entry. Remember when they said, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Just a couple chapters earlier, yeah. just a couple days earlier than this event, you know, he's talking about here. He came uh, on a donkey. He came humbly. He came uh, as a, as a, in peace. The olive branches are there, and he's now he's describing a return that will be. He'll be on a great white steed, a great white horse, and he will be coming, and he will be coming to make war. So. Right now is the best time to tell someone about God's love and God's offer of salvation. Amen. Because when he comes back, like verse 26 is describing, it will be too late. He will not come back and say, I love you and have a wonderful plan for your life. Follow me. He will cast you in the lake of fire if you don't know him. So right now there's a there's a there's a a little space of God's grace offered before this return. And this is this is the this is one of the most sobering passages of scripture in the whole Bible. Because he's telling us over and over again, wake up, take heed, watch, be ready, because he's coming back. And when he returns, that will be the great day of the Lord. So right now we're in a day of grace. And right now we have a great opportunity to spread His grace. So, He says, now, He will send His angels. This is a wonderful verse here, verse 27. Then He will send His angels and gather together His elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Just a scripture language that there's not any part of this globe where His, his elect, His children are, that he will not get them, and he'll send his angels to gather them, to bring them to him. So he takes care of his own. He's coming for his own. He's coming. He's not coming to judge his own. He's coming to, to, to select them and gather them, reward them, and, and, and save them in a, in a finality kind of way, you know, glorify them. And so he's made provision by that, and he's dispatching these great angelic messengers to go get them. Verse 29. Verse 28. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. Wow, he liked, Christ talks about fig trees a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. He cursed one. Chapter 11, we talk about that. To show us the power of faith. And he says, when its branch is ready, it's a parable, has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Now, why would he use the fig tree in this parable to demonstrate such, as opposed to the olive tree? Both were in abundance in ancient Israel. Who knows the answer? 
Lesser on the Mount of Olives. It's a mall of that discourse. The olive tree was evergreen, right? It was a 12 month out of the year tree. But the fig tree was seasonal. And when you saw those leaves and you saw the, the signs, right, that the fruit is coming, you knew you could look at the tree and could tell there's this tree is going to be producing fruit. You could prepare, you could be ready, knowing the harvest is coming for the fig tree. So he uses the fig tree as an example. Israel is referred to over and over again if you look at uh, in the scriptures here, Joel and Jeremiah <clears throat> as is an analogy of a fig tree. So it's commonly used in scripture. It's the the fig tree is used often in a figurative way. <laughs> no pun intended. Insert dad joke. Move on. Okay. So you see when these things happen, it's near at the doors. Now look at verse 30. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away to all these saints take place. This generation will be a reference to the generation that is seeing these apocalyptic happenings that are coming. Those that were with them weren't witnessing all these things happening. They were seeing a glimpse of them, but not at the level Christ is talking about. Verse 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. And I put this question here. Why is the eternal accuracy of his word so important? Anybody, everybody? Because he is God and as God, he is omniscient. He knows all. Okay. Anybody else? And if he said something and it wasn't true, then it would be a lie. <laughs> Yep, good. We live the perfect life. He has no life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The no one comes to the Father. <clears throat> yeah, this is one of the the mountaintop, premium facey, absolute quintessential statements of Jesus in the whole Bible. Heaven and earth will pass away. You see how fleeting it is, right? You say it's gone. You see, people literally were enjoying fishing. In Lake Lord, and within hours, everything's gone. They're gone. Everything's washed away. You see how fleeting the earth is. See how, you know, catastrophe. But he says, but my word. How is his word such a sure foundation? How is it a sure foundation in your life? How is his word something you've clung to? How has it been bedrock for your faith? Anybody, everybody? Any testimonies? It's the only thing you can believe. Yeah. Very good. Man, ain't never told you the truth. That's true. Yeah. Man, just like yeah. a big We're hearing a lot of words, aren't we? Yeah, it's just like a big tree. Green on the outside. Dead man there you don't go. On the inside. Yeah, great point. Yeah, you Brother Wasserman. Yep. You can't lie to him. Yeah. He knows the truth. Yeah. Yeah, every word of God is true. Every word of God is sure. Proverbs 30, verse 5. He's a shield of those who trust him. Go right here, Brother Wasilewski, then we'll swing back over here. The Lord provides. Sure. Mm. Man, God provides. Yep, very good. Okay, and right over here behind you. I'll just show that. Yeah, two things on the Word of God. The Logos is an extension of the nature of God. Yeah. So they are one, and uh, it reflects His character. Your Word, if you are as good as your Word, God is as good as His Word. On the other point, though, the fig tree, that you may or may not know this. Um, we often thought that the reestablishment of Israel in 1948 was this beginning of the fig tree, the mm -hmm. of this sign that his approach is near. Not Dave said it, but no, you're in the sea. But uh, who has heard of the Aliyah? Okay. The Aliyah occurred in the 1990s, and that was the period when the Russians released the Jews from the USSR, released the Jews. They came back in rows, approximately a million plus Jews came back during the 1990s. Netanyahu said that that saved the nation. That was in the beginning of the first in Intifada. And so that was the fig tree, not being planted, but the tender roots spreading and bringing forth new life. So Israel was planted, replanted in 48. And in the Aliyah in the 1990s, there was a spurt of growth. And I believe that was this fulfillment. So we know we're very close. No dates in it, but we know we're very close. Well, that's good. Yeah. All right. 
So his word is a sure word. And we can bank on it. Anyone else? I, I, hands hit, went up real quick or not could get them. Okay. So <clears throat> my word will by no means pass away. And, and you know, that, isn't that encouraging? That we know it's going to happen exactly how he's, it's going to happen. He keeps all his promises. King Jesus keeps every promise he ever made, right? His word is true. I'm just going to say there's so many promises in the Bible. Yeah, all the prophecies. There's thousands of prophecies that have been fulfilled. Hundreds of them. Go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, so if his words will never pass away, that means that we would be with him for all eternity. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Absolutely. It's a sure word, and you can, you can take it to the bank. His word is his bond. And, and, and his, he... Has God ever broken a promise? No, no, no. And so, and this is, by the way, the the word of God is authentic. And so, but but, but you got you got to go from the academic understanding of that to the to, to having it transplanted in your soul. You see, that's why Jesus says, "If you abide in me, and my word abides abides in you." That's why. The psalmist said, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. So here's what happens. The more my life gets in his word, and the more his word gets in my life, what happens? It authenticates my life. I become authentic. Because his word is strong in them. It's, it is said of the young men of God in 1 John 2, it says, these are the young men of God. They're, the Word of God is strong in them. Yes. And so the question is, is the Word of God strong in you? Yeah. Because that is how you walk with God, is you listen to God through His Word. And you live in His Word. Yeah. You're in the Word. You're like Colossians describes it. Paul says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, so you're in the Word, you're walking in the Word, you're living the Word, you're sharing the Word. It's, you know, yes. you're, you're, the voice of God is in your mind when the Word of God is, you're meditating on it. Ralph, Ralph. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I was born two months after the birth of Israel in 1948. So I'm hanging my hat on that. I'm taking my picture on that. That all things, all these things will happen before that generation passes away. So you're looking, you want to know how old Israel is as a nation, you're looking at me. How about that? I'm 76 years old. Wow. And I'm. So why does no one know the time or the hour? Look at this next statement. Um, <clears throat> by the by that, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. So it's a this is a this is a, a mystery. Okay? That it, the, the day is not known. And this is a, also a powerful picture of the humanity of Christ. He was 100% God. He is 100% man. And he willingly laid down his divine prerogatives. Allah is described in Philippians 2.5. Though he was God, he laid aside. He did not count his equality with God as something he grasped, but he willingly laid aside. And he humbled himself and became a servant even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Christ willingly laid down divine progress. And then there were times where he picked those divine progress back up. as led by the Spirit, like in John 1, 48, when he said to Nathaniel, I saw you and you were under the fig tree. The fig tree. Another one. The fig tree. So he would, you know, but, but he willingly subjected himself, he willingly took on human flesh so that he could redeem us. Yes. And so so we have that same here. And I love what this one pastor said. His name's Mike Winger. He says, this does not undermine his deity, but it simply reassures us of his humanity. That Christ was fully human. And the beautiful part of that can be seen vividly in Hebrews chapter 4, where it says he was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin. That's the high priest who goes before us, who makes intercession for us. And so here Christ is saying, look, and it's also another statement by him saying, 
quit going out there trying to pick the times and quit trying to be date, you know, be obsessed with these dates and, you know, and prognosticating the dates, you know, and, and by the way, this was in Acts chapter one, the, the resurrected Jesus in Acts chapter one, they said, when is this going to happen? Again, they asked him that question. They want to know when he says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Yes. So he's saying, go. We're going to come back to that at the very end. So <clears throat> this is a this is Jesus saying, we're going to focus on the business at hand. Right. And this is where he goes next. And look at what he says. He says, take heed. Everyone say, take heed. Take, take heed. heed. Three words. Take right. heed. Watch. Everyone say, watch. 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 This is the alert. Okay? This is be as we say on, on the basketball court. The coach says, "Stand a pivot." You're on a pivot. You know you're you're watching. You're you're seeing everything. You're aware. You're cognizant of what's going on around you. And pray. I want to say pray. 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 Oh, wow. We're going to get to this, by the way, in the garden when he says, "Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation." You think it's a beautiful garden? It's the middle of the night. The disciples are. Man, they got a food coma from, coma from the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> they're, they're about to crush a power nap. And the Savior is on His knees praying. And He's sweating as it were drops of blood. This is the epic moment of spiritual warfare in the universe. This is when the suffering is happening. And He says to the disciples, Can you not tarry with me for one hour? He says, Watch and pray. And so it's both things. You know, it's not, you know, pray. Pray, praying is a is a is a is a sense of God consciousness. You know, it's not just your heads, you know, your heads bowed, your eyes closed, and you're walking around bumping into people, you know, saying Gregorian chants. And this is a call to prayer, you know, and it's a and it's a powerful call. So he says, <clears throat> take heed, watch, and pray. And this is why you do not know when the time is. So, verse 34, like the song, Jay sings at camp. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but... Maybe soon. Surely soon. Sing it with me. Coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Come on with me. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. Jesus is coming again. Okay, we got choir practice after Wednesday at work. Before the hot dogs get served off the grill here, we'll, we'll get that down, okay? But he's coming. Isn't that exciting? Yes. When's the last time you went and told someone, hey, guess what? Jesus is coming back again. Wow. I mean... Is there any greater news? The king is returning. When's he coming? I don't know, but are you ready? That's the real question. Because if we did know the date, and you don't have Christ, that date's going to come, and what are you going to say? Well, and you know what? You'll say what kids are saying all over college campuses. You know, I'll kind of, when I get a little bit older, I'll get more serious about that thing, you know. You have kids, and you know, then I'll, I'll start going to church, and then I'll start, I'll start listening to what my mammy told me about reading the Bible, and you know, and I'll, you know, you know right now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live it up. And so the date you're saying is okay. So I'll be about 29 and a half when that date's coming. So maybe when I'm 29 and a quarter, I'll start reading my Bible and get right with God. It ain't gonna happen because today's the day of salvation. And I'm going to come back to that at the end. But Brock and Ronnie's got to inject something here. Joe, go, go. Thank you, Stu. I've never heard that song, but thank you. always on. Wait, does he, does he want me to sing it again? Is that a call? All right. Yeah, Brother hey, Law said hey, no. Hey. Brother Law's praying for it. Help not sing that again. I want everybody to look at Brock and Ronnie. Stand up. Look at that guy right there. Look at him. Look at him. He's, he's the... He's the thing that needs to be happening right now. Okay. Get out and vote. Okay. Get Policy out and vote. Persona. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Very good. Yeah, vote for platform, not personality. All right. I don't know how we got there, but we got to get back to work. <laughs> you guys are, you guys are wearing me out today. I'm going to need a, 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 a 
I gotta go read. I gotta go read books at the, at the children's uh, school after this, and y'all are. I may have to go take a nap myself. Okay. You know what Jesus said? Watch over me while I pray. Yes. There was one close by that wasn't praying or watching over Jesus. That was the guy that was going to trade him. That's exactly right. Yeah, he was Jesus. standing there in the bushes ready. Yeah, yeah we're going to get to him, too. Pulling him out. Yeah. Pulling him out. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, um, so here you have Christ jumps into another parable real quick. The journeying master of the house. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to... Watch. There's that word again. Say watch. 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 Verse 35. Watch. And now between verse 34 and verse 37, you have four different commands from Jesus to watch. He says, watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. So watch, there's all these different times he could come. And the question is, what is your life about? How are you in a watchful mood? How are you sober? You know, Peter said this way in 1 Peter 5.8. He said, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I mean, you've seen those videos. You've seen those lines. The little gazelle has no idea that she's about to, you know, that Simba's about to jump on and have, about to have breakfast. Okay? Now picture that. Let me tell you who's watching. Let me tell you who's sober. Let me tell you who's heeding. The devil and the minions and forces of hell have a plan for your life that is far more organized and far more detailed than you have any idea. <coughs> And they want to see you, and, they, and, and you're already in Christ, you're already His elect that's going to be gathered from the four winds of the earth. You know, they know, they, they know they're not going to take that seed, but what do they want to do? They want to, they want to get you distracted. They want to get you focused on politics. They want to get you focused on anything and everything but talking about Jesus. Notice how hard it is today, just think about your next few conversations. Notice how hard it is to bring up Jesus Christ in those conversations. And while you're before the conversation, say, Lord, help, help me to bring up what's really important. What's really valid. See? Think about how we want to talk about everything but the main thing. The main thing. star. The king who is returning. Because let me tell you something. None of the other stuff matters when the king returns. Only one person matters. And the question is, what's your relationship to him? Has he come to cast you into hell so you can pay for your sins forever? Or has He come to receive you because He's already paid for your sins because you received the gift? And so that's all that matters. So the question is, how are you watching? How are you ready? The Master of the house is coming back. <clears throat> Evening, midnight, crowing the rooster in the morning. It covers kind of all the areas of time. And look at verse 36. Lest coming suddenly He find you sleeping. And then idea of sleep, by the way, it's not knocking sleeping. I hope you get a good night's sleep. They call sleep a superpower. It's really important. I hope you I hope you take a Bible verse to bed every night. The last thing you should look at is God's Word. You want God's voice in your mind. It's a spiritual probiotic. You digest it. You think about God's Word as you go to sleep. Don't think about your day. Don't think about how bad a day it was, how good a day it was. You won't sleep well. Think about God's Word. Take one little verse. Take one little phrase. Okay? I took the, this this week. I took this verse to bed with me. The Son of Man. Then you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. I let my mind just meditate on that. Think about what does it look like for to come. Think about all the beautiful cloud thoughts. You know, my mind's going through the Son of Man coming. All the other verses that talk about coming in the clouds. I took this verse to, to bed last night. Take heed, watch and pray. I thought about what are all the synonyms connected to those words. And what happens is God's word gets in you, and it affects your dream state. It affects how you wake in the morning because you have God's Word. The last thing you should look at before you go to bed is God's Word. The first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning is God's Word. Get the voice of God in your mind. Let me tell you the other voices. Eastern meditation is built upon getting everything out of your mind and emptying your mind. That's a dangerous place to be. 
Because Jeremiah tells the heart is deceitful, desperate, the wicked who can know it. And out of the heart comes all these awful things. But biblical meditation is packing, jam packing your mind with God's word. Yeah. So that you're like, uh, like they said, you know, of, of some of the great men of God. <clears throat> Excuse me, John Bunyan. They say when you when you cut him, he bled Bible, Bibline, right? You know, so the word of God. So when you're pressed, does the word of God come out? See. So this is real, real important. Having God's word. And, and taking God's word, because heaven and earth is going to pass away. Everything else you think about is going to pass away, but His word won't pass away. So, so when you sleep, have His word, but don't be sleep in a, in a way of being non-watchful. This is, he's talking about being non-watchful. He's talking about a the wrong kind of slumber, being lazy, being unaware, being like those virgins who weren't ready with their candles. Okay, in the in the parable of ten virgins. Now look at verse thirty-seven. And what I say to all, watch. Everyone say, watch again. Watch. watch. So this is a this is a call to watch. This is a call to be alert. This is a sobering call. So I put these final questions. We got to wrap this thing up. Everyone stand up. Everyone stand up as quietly and calm as you can. As watchful as you can. Why should I be ready? Be alert. Be watching for his great return. Why should I be ready, alert, and watching for Jesus? Anybody? Because he's coming anytime. Exactly right. So we can join him. Yeah, so we can join him. Be ready. This is a this is a great time of celebration, man. You're getting all ready. It's like you're. It's like you know the master of the house is coming back. You're not sure when. You want that house to be ready. You want to be right. You want to be neat. You want to be you know. You want to be. You want to be about what he said to you before he left. Yeah. All right. Right here. Yeah, in Matthew 25, again, Jesus made this very telling statement uh, that when the black good comes, they that were ready will get in the and the other will have time to be ready. Wow. Yeah. Amen. So, the final question here, guys, and this really, this is, this is so convicting. How is reaching the ends of the earth key to the end of times? So, and this is this is from my friend Pastor David Chowick in Charlotte. I love it. He spoke. Billy Graham had just passed away. We're at NRB, and it was our 20th anniversary of Truth Network. And he gave a great message. And he said, you know, everyone's talking about the end of times. When, when, when is the end of times going to come? We got all these debates about the rapture and all this. And this is a sign of time, and you know, with Israel and all that. He says. But he says, if you notice the focus of Christ's words and his last words before he ascended were what? You'll receive power. Go! Everyone say go! Go! go. See, it's go time. Everyone say go time! Go, go time. time! Go time! Those were what those were the words of Christ before he ascended. And so what David Chadwick said is he says, quit obsessing with the ends of times and be obsessed with the ends of the earth. What I can't control is when the king's going to return. Right, right. Because I don't know when. Right. And because he didn't tell me when. Because he knows what he's doing. And his word is a short word. It'll never pass away. But what I can control yeah. right. is I can go talk to someone about Jesus today. Right. And in a free country especially, they're not going to arrest you, Larry, for sharing the gospel. I think what it is is... The Lord wants us to witness as many as we can because when he comes back, guess what? Every man will be without excuse. Because I'll say that man will do that man will do this man. Will do. Yeah. So we are we are we are called to missions. Amen. Right. And we are called to do what we can control. That is winning the lost. And am I obsessed with that? Because we know he's coming back. And we know people need the Lord. And by the time he goes back, and the longer he delays his coming, yes, the heat turns on here, but it's more opportunity for folks that don't know Christ to hear the good news of Christ, including the people we got to get out of here pretty quick here so we can go share with today. So who are you taking the gospel to today? And one of the great legendary missionaries, one of the great men of faith of all time, He's got a school named after him, a church named after him, was D.L. Moody. And you know what one of the saddest days in D.L. Moody's life was? It came on a Sunday night when Moody 
gave the gospel to thousands of people in his church. He gave the gospel, and at the end, instead of giving invitations, they come forward. He said, I want you to go home and think about this. I want you to contemplate it. I want you to discuss it. And in the deal, Moody's in his own words, from his own mouth, says, he says, I wish I had that night over. Because that night, the great Chicago fire broke out. And that night, thousands died. And all kinds of homes and barns and farms and buildings burned to the ground. And D.L. Moody would say, even later in life, he'd say, oh, that I had that moment again. To invite people to come right now. Don't think about it. Don't take any more time. 2 Corinthians 6, what does it say? Behold, now is the acceptable time today. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow. And so what that means, if you don't know Christ and you're watching out here, and thank you, we got people that are, because mama can't be here and others can't be here, so they're watching on the, on the social media channels. If you don't know Jesus, call upon the name of the Lord. Get on your knees. Pull your car over. Trust Him as your Savior. Repent of your sin. Ask Him to save you. Open the Bible. Go get with a bunch of other Christians. Go get baptized to show the world what's happened inside of you. Get with God. Get right with Him. Be reconciled with God. And if you're a believer, I'm putting the heat on you. Because Jesus put the heat on all of us. He says in verse 10, this gospel will be preached to all the nations. So what he says, it's go time for you. So call people to be saved, not tomorrow. We'll all witness to them later on. You know, I'm going to set an appointment for on out there. No, today, wherever you're going, every appointment you have today is a divine appointment. Yeah. Let me tell you why you're meeting with that person. I don't really want to go through my estate today. I don't really want to tell you. I don't really want to get that tooth pulled. You are there to bring the truth to the tooth man, okay? Yes. You are there everywhere you go, as awkward as this. Reunions, whatever. You're on a mission trip. Yes. Now, Steve and those boys and Fred are on an airplane. They're in Vegas right now with us. And they're landing right about now. We said we pray for them. Yeah. But everywhere you go, every trip is a mission trip because life is a mission trip. So what we can't control, share the gospel. We can't control when he's coming back. But we're excited for that day. Chetwood... You're about as aggressive an evangelist I've ever met, and you have challenged all of us to go to the ends of the earth. You have, uh, you have uh, in Mayberry Restaurant in Dario, led people to Christ that uh, they had no idea that I was bringing this guy to lunch, and two hours later they walk out with joy in their heart because you, you led them to Christ, and I thank you for that. Will you pray us out of here and uh, as we get out to share the Lord? Oh, yeah. He did say he when he would return. Matthew 24, 24, 14. I will return when this gospel message has been carried to every nation. In seminary, you learn every tribe and ethnos group. When they have heard, guess what? I'm here to tell you, they've heard. They've heard. He can come any moment, and it's when the Father tells him, come on. And then every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. A moment could be today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the marching orders given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the commander in chief, the one, his last words, uh, that we are to watch. We are to watch for his coming, but we are to be ready and doing what he said to do, what he commanded us to do. It is not the great suggestion. It is a commandment from Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them what I have told you, and so I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and therefore you go. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, in Winston-Salem, in North Carolina, in the United States of America, in Canada, in the Caribbean, to the ends of the earth, in Cambodia. Father, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping here today, hearing your word, coming together to hear your word, uh, the words from your mouth. Father, it is an incredible to ponder 
all that has taken place. And Father, as we go, we pray that we would go in the power of your Holy Spirit with your anointing, because nobody here can save anybody, but your Holy Spirit can draw, convict of sin, and save. And so we thank you for the privilege of watching you work, not only here, but all over the world. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.